This is a true story that begins a long time ago about a journalist from China and his friends from America. It's a story of profound possibility about the hope that the people of China and America can create and sustain a profound, lasting friendship. The story of friendship between our two people, uh, something that we feel is worth telling. The Chinese people will never forget the friendship forged in blood by the people of China and the United States in the anti-Japanese war during World War II. This is more than a war story, however. It's also a story of Americans and Chinese working together with trust and respect, making common cause of a common challenge. In 1944, as World War II raged around them, Chinese students and American soldiers meet in China. What happened between them that would ensure a friendship so long and deep that it would endure over a lifetime and stretch across ocean? Our film crew has been following them for more than 10 years, and this is how it happened. It's 2003, Queens, New York. Dick Pastor and his wife Naomi are anxiously awaiting a visitor. When the guy, when his insurance inside the building, the, uh, hold on, we'll 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 be there. Uh, the Dick, go out. No. How are you? Why, that's so oh good. God, it's yeah, yeah. Nice. I mean, you look younger every year. <laughs> <laughs> Their visitor is Zhang Yan, 81 years old, a journalist from China. Dick and Zhang Yan have known each other for nearly 60 years. Mm. You know this fella? Yeah, he said hello as he came in. Zhang Yan, it's great to see you. You look yes. great. Welcome back That's to New York. York. Come on, put your things down. Okay. Make yourself at home. I don't know, do it. I mean, let me take I that. I have taken many of the things down because. You want to take your jacket off? I everything to my children. Or are you going for me? It's all right. <laughs> all right, that's two of you. <laughs> <laughs> Zhang Yan is thinking about his old friend, Morris Wald. He looks, but doesn't find him. Benji is Morris's son. He tells Zhang Yan that his father passed away just the day before. And I just want it known that Morris and I bunked side by side in Kunming. And I was with him when he got the mail announcing this man's birth. I, he was a very excited father. In 1944, Dick and Morris arrived in Kunming in rugged southwest China. They were volunteers with the U.S. 14th Army Air Corps, now known as the Flying Tigers. Their mission? To help fight the Japanese invasion of China. The young men became friends with Xiang Yan and others in China, and they helped to write history. This is my favorite uh, self-portrait of his. This is the, uh, the little booties 
and the um, that was for you. and the cap. That he brought that back for me. But I'm sorry to hear that uh, Morris Ward passed away yeah. just this Monday. I was expecting him to be here today. Yes. So, yes. I'm also sorry for you because we have so many good friends passed away, like Edward Bell, Howard Hyman, and J. Eugene Reich. Zhang Yan said farewell to Morris at his funeral service. Now, among Zhang Yan's old compatriots from New York, only Dick Pastor remains. The roots of their story go back to September 18, 1931, when Japan first invaded and occupied northeastern China. Six years later, Japan moved to occupy more of China and began marching south. people of China rose up together to defend their country. Every party and region joined in, under the joint leadership of the Kuomintang and the Communist Party. Resistance fighters engaged Japan on many fronts and formed a common strategy. Japan's military might was greater than the young Chinese forces. Quickly, more and more of China's vast territories fell. The Chinese nationalist government was forced out of Nanjing and had to move to a new capital in Chongqing. Whole factories were forced to relocate to remote southwestern China. Many people became refugees in Tsinghua, Nankai, and Peking University, moved everyone to Kunming. They formed Southwest Associated University, where Zhang Yan was a student and his friend, Ma Shitu, was leader of a student movement to support the war against Japan. In this time of national crisis, the students stood together in the defense movement, persuading the people of the whole country to resist. <laughs> The student movement spread like wildfire all over the country, but China stood almost alone against the invasion. In 1937, Sung Mei Ling was general secretary of the Aviation Committee of China. She invited a retired American flight instructor, Claire Chanot, to advise the young Chinese Air Force. In May 1940, the new capital of Chongqing was savagely bombarded by Japanese warplanes. Chiang Kai-shek, then president of the Republic of China, urgently summoned Claire Chanot to his official home in Chongqing. He and his wife, Song Meiling, told Chanot that China had lost almost all of its warplanes. He said, having thought for a long time, I consider you to be the only one who can help me. I ask you to go back to the U.S. and get 500 new planes and 300 pilots to help us fight the Japanese. Chanot had witnessed the devastation and indiscriminate bombing and heard the call to help the Chinese people however he could. He hurried back to America to seek help from the U.S. government to rebuild the Chinese Air Force. Though America had not yet entered the war with Japan, President Roosevelt weighed the human need and the strategic importance of China. He signed a private order to allow Americans to volunteer with the American Volunteer Group in support of China's defense efforts.
on July 10, 1941, this American volunteer group left America for China and landed in Kunming. They brought P-40 Warhawk fighter planes, sprayed with a shark logo to show determination and strength. After a few months of training, the American pilots under the command of Claire Cheneau began to engage in air battles against the Japanese. These scenes were shot from cameras mounted near the plane's forward guns. Every plane shot down and every target hit was recorded. The first battle won by the American volunteer group was also recorded near Kunming on December 20th, 1941. That day, six out of eleven Japanese planes were shot down and three were damaged, while only one American plane was damaged. Newspapers all over China celebrated this battle on the front page. Excited, the people described Cheneau and his young American pilots as tigers with wings. And so history was made. Cheneau and his flying tigers became heroes in the hearts of the Chinese people. Cheneau found not only victory in China, he found love. He captured the heart of an attractive woman reporter from the China Central News Agency. Her name was Chen Xiangmei, and she later became his wife, Anna Cheneau. While the Flying Tigers supported China, Chen Xiangmei expressed the Chinese people's love for the Flying Tigers. She made sure that the people provided aid to the American pilots in any way they could. As General Cheneau wrote in his memoir, no Chinese ever refused to help American pilots during the war. Back then, the American pilots endured a lot of hardship. Food was scarce, and for quite a while, the pilots had no eggs to eat. Some Chinese civilians heard that they needed eggs, so they sent all the eggs they had to the pilot. That was very moving. At that time, pilots of the Flying Tigers had this emblem on the back of their flight jackets. If they encountered any trouble or got shot down, people would know they were Americans there to help China and hope that Chinese civilians and military forces would help them. News of General Cheneau and the Flying Tigers spread far and wide. They were celebrated by the Chinese and by their fellow Americans back home. They drew supporters like Dick Pastor and Morris Wald, then living in New York. Like many other Americans, they were watching the struggle of the Chinese people closely. This is the Battle of China. This, the great city of Shanghai, on a September day in 1937. This, the fearful beginning of a new kind of war. This, the first mass bombing from the air of a helpless civilian population. Dick and Morris actively supported China's war efforts and joined many rallies throughout the United States to attract public support. On December 7, 1941, Japan launched a surprise attack on the American naval base at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. President Roosevelt said, It was a day that will live in infamy. Congress and the whole nation were outraged. And the next day, President Roosevelt declared war on Japan.
the United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. With confidence in our armed forces, with the unbounding determination of our people, we will gain the inevitable triumph, so help us God. In July 1942, Roosevelt addressed the people of China directly. He said, you know, and the whole world knows, how well you fought the war. This is a battle fought by the whole of mankind. In February 1943, Madame Chiang Kai-shek visited the United States, seeking American support for China's struggle with Japan. She spoke to the United States Congress, and her speech was broadcast nationwide. We in China, like you, want a better world. Not for ourselves alone, but for all mankind. And we must have it. Throughout the United States, people volunteered to join the war effort. Among them were Dick Pastor and Morris Wald, who volunteered to go to Kunming, China, to serve in the Flying Tigers. At first, China was a mystery to Dick and Morris. Their only real understanding came from the book Red Star Over China by Edgar Snow. An American writer, Snow had written about his visit to the headquarters of the Chinese Communist Party, then in Yan'an in 1936. He was one of the first Westerners to interview Mao Zedong. This book led the young men to China. It was the first link and helped to create 60 years of friendship between them, Zhang Yan, and their other Chinese friends. A man named Mao Zedong, uh, nobody had ever heard of him before, but suddenly they began to hear a lot about him. This story began to unfold through a great book, Red Star Over China by Edgar Snow. It was him who brought the facts of Chinese life and society to the attention of the American people. Reading this book secretly, the Chinese people found a new world, the liberated areas led by the Communist Party. This was a great revelation to me, to most Americans. Actually, it was this book which linked us together. The Flying Tigers were incorporated into the 14th Army Air Corps, and Claire Cheneau was appointed Major General. Now officially engaged in the war against Japan, America expanded the U.S. Air Force commitment to China. They kept the name Flying Tigers and fought across the skies of the whole country. Dick Pastor was assigned to a photo intelligence detachment team to analyze the enemy's military intelligence gathered from aerial photos. From their base in Kunming, Dick and Morris discovered that behind enemy lines, soldiers and civilians, led by the Communist Party, fought tenaciously. They won tough victories that isolated the enemy, sometimes pinning them down in big cities along the railway line. In 1944, the U.S. government sent an army observer group known as the Dixie Mission to Yan'an, the base of the Communist Party. They collected information about the Japanese order of battle and documented the extent of communist military efforts in the war against Japan. Together, they coordinated search and rescue of downed Allied pilots in communist-controlled areas. Their joint efforts were strongly supported by Communist Party leaders, the local army, and civilian. Dick and Morris were fascinated by the energy of the area of Yan'an. What made it so special? Why were so many young people rushing to this place to join the war? They frequented a bookstore in Kunming, looking for insight. It was here that they met Ma Shetu, 
a student at Southwestern Associated University. One day, while reading a book at a bookstore on Nanping Street, I saw two American GIs entering this bookstore. Later, I learned that they were Dick Pastor and Morris Wald. Well, another GI, Morris Wald, and I were in a bookstore in Kunming, just browsing, and we came across one English title on the shelves, and we took it down. And we were looking through it, leafing through it, when suddenly a voice came over our shoulder. Interesting, isn't it? And we said, yeah. I was somewhat surprised and wondered why they wanted to know about the liberated areas in North China. At that time, I was the main person in charge of the Communist Party at the university, so I was somewhat sensitive. He said, would you like to meet some of my friends? And we leaped at the opportunity, and the, within a few days, we were meeting with Donald and others from the university. That evening, Zhang Yan met with Dick and Morris for the first time. Thus began a series of intense meetings with others from the Flying Tigers, between Zhang Yan, Howard Hyman, and Edward Bell, introduced by Li Chu Wen, a student officer of the YMCA. Then came Jack Edelman and many others. Chang Yan later wrote about these extraordinary meetings between the Americans and the Chinese. These American youth are all bright and straightforward, believing in an ideal and just society, a world of peace and friendship. They came to China to fight alongside the Chinese people against invasion, Quite unexpectedly, they found a series of poor beggars on the streets of Kunming and were told that some officials were making a lot of money by selling U.S. aid goods. Concerned, they wanted to know why. They were told that areas controlled by the Communist Party presented quite a different picture, and this made them thirsty to understand what was really happening. So they were happy to meet some Chinese friends who understood, and everyone talked intensely about the current situation in both China and the U.S. The Americans had no idea that there was any successful uh, Chinese war effort. In the North, the Chinese, the Communist Chinese, had uh, liberated sections of the North and established communications there in what was called the liberated areas. And they told the American servicemen about this, and it was a big shock. They had no idea you know, the, the Chinese uh, military was not known for its successes. And we translated articles in the Sinhua Daily and Mass Weekly about the liberated areas, base areas in North China, and gave them the translation. And we began to discuss world problems, American problems, Chinese problems. And it, it, it was so vigorous and so refreshing. Uh, I know that at the end of an evening, I would go back and sit down at a typewriter and write three, four pages uh, and send it home of, of this exciting news. Since then, we had frequent contacts with those American youths. Once every two weeks for almost two years, we met either in our university or at the Kunming YMCA or at a picnic at the Big View Pavilion Park. As the Flying Tigers and the Chinese students developed a closer relationship, the Americans wanted to know about the liberated areas personally. One summer night, Edward Bell and Howard Hyman took Zhang Yan and Li Chuen by truck to the barracks of the 14th U.S. Air Force, located on the eastern outskirts of Kunming. Entering the auditorium, they were met with warm applause from the American officers and soldiers. In his opening remarks, Bell told the audience about their friendship and announced that Zhang Yan was going to tell them about the Chinese liberated areas. The American soldiers were eager to hear the news. This event was so successful that later Zhang Yan was followed and attacked by Kuomintang secret agents who did not want American GIs to know about the communist-led liberated areas. 
In December 1944, Japanese troops were closing in on Kunming. The city was in great danger, but the American Air Force was not equipped to fight on the ground. If Japanese troops attacked them, the Chinese were determined to protect the Flying Tigers. Realizing that there were still Americans in Kunming, we needed to tell them about the danger facing them. If they agreed, we suggested that they go with us to a safe place, or even to join us in guerrilla warfare. The underground party organization assigned me to bicycle to the American base. It was a tense moment, deep at night. The soldiers were already sleeping, and I woke them up and informed them of our plan. They were very moved. Only later did I realize that this episode left a deep impression on them. In an article in U.S. China Magazine in 1973, Dick wrote about what happened that night as a testimony to the friendship between the people of America and China. Later, Dick Pastor wrote, Out of concern for what such an attack could mean to our Chinese friends, we warned them as speedily as we could of the growing danger. What we did not know then was that their concern for us was even greater than ours was for them. At 3 a.m. the following morning, I was awakened in the dark in the barracks by someone urgently shaking my shoulder. It was Donald Chang, also known as Xiang Yan. The meeting ended, he said, with a decision to invite us in the event that the attack came so that they could protect us and escort us to our next destination. The attack never came, but I remember that invitation as a beautiful example of solidarity and friendship between our two peoples. Beginning in March 1943, the Flying Tigers had ever-increasing success shooting down 2,600 enemy planes, sinking and damaging 44 enemy vessels, and killing over 66,700 Japanese soldiers. The Flying Tigers eliminated Japan's air superiority and provided a backbone of support for the Chinese war effort. This is long remembered by the local people. Chinese Prime Minister Wen Jiabao stated, between May 1942 and September 1945, the United States sent its young pilots, who were recruited as airmen of the Flying Tigers, to support China in its war against fascism. They flew over the famous Hump Skyway, one of the world's most difficult and dangerous flight paths, a testament to the close cooperation between America and China. During the war, 2,186 American airmen and soldiers sacrificed their lives to fight for China. Each one has his name inscribed on this monument. They will forever live in the hearts of the Chinese and American peoples. Spontaneous celebrations erupt throughout the world. My fellow countrymen, a great tragedy has ended. A great victory has been won.
people in the United States and all over the world celebrated victory, none more fervently than the Flying Tigers, rejoicing alongside their Chinese friends. Jiang Yan, then a reporter for the United States Information Service, covered this unforgettable moment. So many Chinese expressed their gratitude to the Flying Tigers. Tens of thousands came out to say farewell to Claire Chanel. One Chinese general said, no one since Marco Polo has won the hearts of the Chinese like this. Jiang Yan traveled to Zhejiang in Hunan province to cover the formal surrender of Japan in China. Jiang Yan was assigned to cover the negotiations between the Kuomintang and the Communist Party in Chongqing. Mao Zedong was there, negotiating with Chiang Kai-shek, leader of the Kuomintang. Also at the negotiation, American General Patrick Hurley. It was the end of the war, and the American soldiers were ready to return home. But before they left, Zhou Enlai met with Dick Pastor and Morris Wald. It was an honor in consideration of their friendship with Chinese students. Zhou Enlai later became the premier of the People's Republic of China. We were fortunate enough, one of the other GIs and I were fortunate enough to be escorted to a meeting with Joe and Lai. Uh, we sat down, he came in, sailed his Panama hat to the hat rack and said, hi fellas, my name is Joe. And from that point on, this man spoke fluent English for the next couple of hours. Then Howard Hyman, Ed Bell and Jack Edelman left Kunming to pass through Chongqing on their way back to America. Li Chu-wen, their close friend while in Kunming, and Gong Peng, secretary of the communist delegation stationed in Chongqing, finally realized their dream of meeting Mao Zedong. The meeting was arranged by Zhou Enlai. Mao Zedong invited them for dinner, during which he asked them many questions about the United States. Among these three Flying Tiger GIs who were Jiang Yan's friends, only Jack Edelman is still alive today. In Santa Monica, California, he shared some details of that meeting with Mao. We knew that Mao liked to smoke cigarettes, so we brought him a carton of American cigarettes. He said, Mao Zedong said that you are very generous in giving me several packs of cigarettes, while Hurley only gave me one cigarette when he came to Yunnan. We had dinner and had spent a couple of hours, and more than, rather than us ask questions, Mao was asking the question. He wanted to know about America and what we thought and, and these kind of things. Mao told these three brave young Americans that the Chinese and American people have much in common and should always be friends. They asked Mao, how could Americans help China? Mao Zedong told them, when you go back to your country, please tell the American people what you really saw in China and about its people. He then said, it's getting dark now, let's take a photo outside the gate. They had a picture taken in front of a banana tree. 
a historic picture which later would become famous. And this story went to, down to Mao's work. He did write about the Sunken negotiation, and he, he has briefly mentioned that we have contact with representative of, of American people. <laughs> At that time, the United States was assisting Chiang Kai-shek in its civil war against the Communists. Mao Zedong told them that the friendship between the Chinese and American people would surely continue to develop. That prediction was made as early as that time. The Americans were very moved hearing what Mao said. The Flying Tigers took home a profound love for China and its people. Though separated geographically, as the years rolled by, they missed their friends more and more. They did not know if they would ever see each other again. From a simple meeting came a great friendship. A long, productive life unfolded, but the old friends were separated. They wanted to get back together, but didn't know it would take 35 years for their wish to come true.